Hello everyone, this is another episode of Obsidian Radio with your host Najee, a show dedicated to opening our minds to other realities. Please listen, learn, and enjoy. Hello? Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. You don't sound muffled or anything, do you? Do I? No, a little bit. Um, oh, okay. I can hear you well enough. I'll just turn up. Uh, yeah, I'm up at the maximum volume. Uh, same here. Oh, okay. That's better. Glad to finally talk to you. Um, you did. So I'm going to start my intro, I guess. Uh, hello, everyone. This is episode six of Obsidian Radio. And today we'll be talking with Allison. I hope I'm getting your last name right. Tymon? Tymon. Tymon, okay. And, A.K.A. Typhon Blue of Honey Badger Radio, mm-hmm. and I don't really have much of a bio about you, so I guess you could just start explaining about whatever you feel like talking about by yourself. What would be relevant to to background? Uh, mm-hmm. Background is basically when you first started getting like I guess conscious about like the gender issue of modern day society. Well. um... Uh, it was after I'd come back from an all-girls boarding school, and my mother had decided that I was getting too radical feminist, so she gave me a book called Princess at the Window, which introduced me to the uh, counter-feminist or non-feminist narrative, and then I started reading about it when I went off to university. And then I ended up on chat groups, uh, or um, news groups, in um, the late 90s, and uh on uh, internet forums in in the early 2000s and then from there I started a blog in about 2011 called uh, Gender Addict which looked at the the issues from a more holistic perspective both men and women uh, how they impact both men and women and then um, in 2013 I started Honey Badger Radio with Hannah Wallen and Karen Strong um, and here we are <laughs> it's a uh, Hannah Wallen. Hannah Wallen. Okay. It wasn't. It wasn't. It's not a really great um, story. I don't have like a dramatic moment that made me wake up. It was just simple curiosity, really. So. Uh, okay. So it's like a steady thing, not like a big epiphany. No, no. It was. Like, it was just curiosity about the issues, and then it. it a lot of the stuff made sense to me. Mm. So I pursued looking into it further. Um, do you still run your YouTube channel? Uh, you mine? You mean, uh, Typhon, or the Gender Addict channel? Yeah, I still, I still put stuff up there. Oh, yeah, two of them. Or am I confused? All uh, right. well, Gender Addict is my personal channel, or, uh, was, was my channel that I shared with the blog that I started with, uh, Ginkgo and another individual who since left, um, oh, goodness, I forget his screen name. Uh, but, uh, uh, and then I also have the YouTube channel for Honey Badger Radio that um, I, I share with um, the people involved in that project. I thought there was one called Typhon Blue, or is that an- another one? Uh, yeah, there is one called Typhon Blue, but I mostly just put my my, my art installations up on it and some oh, other okay. stuff. So it's not really uh, it's not really it's not really related to this to men's issues or any of the stuff that is talked about. In with in the, those communities. Um, let me see. Oh, that's my next one. So, um, how did you meet Karen and uh, yeah, Karen Strawn? Uh, I actually met her through Men's Rights Reddit. Men's Rights. Okay. That, okay. Yeah, I just uh, I noticed that she argued in a lot of the same ways that well, I mean, not in the same ways, but sort of had the same content. Um, and uh, concerns in her arguments that I had, so I decided to message her, and uh, okay. we just started talking from there. Uh, let me see. But who else is on there? Like, I know there's a whole bunch of you on like on the, the different episodes of Honey Badger. Is you? Is Karen? Well, there's and, also like... Rachel Edwards. Um, Ooh, she's the naughty nerd ass uh, on Tumblr, and uh, there's also Anna Cherry, who is a cam girl. Uh, or professional naked girl, as she likes to call it. <laughs> and, and then there's uh, there's a few others that come on occasionally, and others who've been on in the past who haven't been on, who sort of uh, moved on or or are aren't are on less frequently. 
Um, there's Brian Martinez, who helps a lot with the admin work, and um, Mike Stephenson or Stevenson or Dr. Randomer Kim. So th those are the main ones. Um, the 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 other ones, uh, you know, they have their own projects. They, they do, they come in and out. Um, okay. We've had Lauren Southern, Mercedes Carrera. Oh, um, I've seen that video where she protested those feminists in Canada and they ripped her sign down. I think. Yeah. Yeah, or they stood in front of her, or both. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um. Yeah, that's 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 my own problem. Now, the Honey Badger Radio, like, how old is that, like, and how'd that get started, or can you go into details about it? Well, we started in 2013, um, in, oh. like, uh, I think the end of August, and, um, oh, so, so like it's been years. around for about two years now. Okay. And, uh, I had the original idea of just doing a show about what, with three, uh, I guess, female men's rights activists or people who identify as anti-feminist, mm. and originally it was on... Uh, a Voice for Men's Blog Talk radio channel. Right, uh, I remember that. Then we moved briefly to YouTube um, and did a bunch on YouTube. And then we moved back to uh, A Voice for Men's uh, um, Live 365 channel. Um, and then we moved back to YouTube. So we've been on, on those, those, those platforms. Um, and then now we're mostly we mostly just do Google Plus through YouTube. Um, where'd you get Typhon Blue from? I liked it. I don't know. Do you still use it? I'm just curious. Uh, I still use it because people a lot of people know me under that name. Oh, okay. Um, Typhon is actually the Greek name for the Egyptian god Seth. I th yeah, yeah. I, I think I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the Egyptian god Seth was originally the god of. Um, uh, the Lord of Storms, uh, or and also the desert. So uh, he originally was a much more uh, a much more heroic character because he stood on the on the bow of the 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 boat of Ra and killed the the serpent uh, so that the sun could travel across the sky. But then he sort of got dethroned and turned into the role of villain. So. Um, that that that's that sort of, so that that mythology sort of resonates with me. This idea that um, you know you people who take on these roles of uh, heroism usually end up at some point becoming a villain or being seen as a villain, not necessarily becoming a villain. Right, they get portrayed a certain way. Yeah, because mm. they they take on this role of of having a high degree of agency. And then what tends up happen, happening is that people just that they 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 applaud them, but then they hang their own their own sins and problems on them, and and uh, and then cast them out because they they failed to solve them. Um, and I just I, I thought that was just a, an interesting sort of uh, situation in mythology. So I, I took the name. Um, and, and that's, that's that, really. Mm. Um, okay. Um, let me see. Going into the men's rights issues or the men's issues in general, like, what do you think is, like, the most important thing? Or, like, let me put it this way. What are, like, the top three things that you think are the most important right now in terms of modern society when it comes to how men and women relate? Um, the top three? Well, I've always had my great, my, um, my focus has gener been, generally been sexual violence towards men, mm. specifically sexual violence towards men uh, perpetrated by women, um, and against men and boys perpetrated by women, because this is the really the real taboo, and I think it's also the linchpin um, yeah. for why we see men in the situation where we we just cannot see them as vulnerable. That that element of um, of, of of seeing their sexuality is as predatory and not and having no vulnerabilities is underlies the perception that they have. They can never be in a situation where they're, they're vulnerable, I think. So I think it's like the linchpin. And then after mm. that, I would say suicide. Um, okay. Ooh, three, that's hard. Suicide uh, and custody. And I would also say circumcision, but that's four. So I don't bodily autonomy would be 
a big thing. So, and in that, I would include the ability to choose not to be a father as well. So all of the all of the stuff related to bodily autonomy, cir- uh, circumcision, draft. I would consider the draft to be cons- to be an element of bodily autonomy. Um, and what I mean by bodily autonomy is our society seems to consider men's bodies to be public property, right. to be disposed of as as they wish in war or in terms of circumcision to for cultural genital aesthetics um, or in terms of uh, reproduction they don't have any control over their genetic material no. and Monsanto has more control over its genetic material than a man does that's sick uh, so there you go that's those are the and and suicide those are the ones and not quite it, it's sort of three a little muddled but there you go that's okay You have a speaker in the background? I hear like an echo for some reason. No, I don't have a speaker in the background. Okay, I'm not sure what that is. Okay. Um, I just had some random points that I want to get to, but that's fine with you. But um, Sure. Is the echo problematic? Eh, no, not too problematic. It seems like it actually might have gone away by now, so okay. Okay. But um, have you been, have you been following these uh, like, uh, big media stories about the false rape claims on uh, college campuses? Yeah, I followed some of them. I don't know if I followed all of them. Uh, I can't remember the, the most recent one. The one where she was carrying a mattress somewhere. Yeah, I followed that. I, I'm very bad with names, so I'm not going to be able to no, say that, anything. That's fine, but I, I can't remember all the details. What was the detail about that? If you, if, or you don't remember? Um, I'm not really the best one to talk about like things pulled from the he- the, 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 um, okay. the headlines. Just because um, that's much, much more of a Karen or Hannah thing. Okay. I'm more of a theorist, so I, I understand it in the overall picture. Ooh. But from what I can tell, the the boy or the young man that she charged with sexual assault um, was found not guilty by a college tribunal, which means, and, and that is like 50.01% that's all they would need to find him guilty. So it's it's not even a standard where uh, of conviction it, that you would find in a court. So most likely he, they probably found out that it was it was completely unlikely that he had done anything. Mm. Uh, and then in in response, she started to carry or she she did this art project where she carried around a mattress to um uh, to try to bring awareness to to women who were subject to sexual assault and then ignored by the campus tribunal um, or, or, or were defeated by the system. I don't know, were, were not served by the system immediately, believing them and doing whatever. Um, and uh, my personal take on it is that she's probably abusive. Um, she She wants the attention. Right. And she might have convinced herself this has happened, but um, <laughs> from the texts... Um, if anyone was sexually abusive, it was her. At least, at least that was my impression. I, I don't want to. I don't want anyone to quote me on that because I'd have no, to re- reread all of the stuff that I've read about that and identify exactly where I got that impression. Um, but yeah, I, I, so I don't even know if I want to put that out there. Um, like I said, I'm not the best person to ask about these specific kind of um, events. This is this is much more a Karen or Hannah question. But you say you understand like the greater scope of it. Could you explain that more? Well, I understand that the the issues happening in in college. Um, we're we're seeing tribunals where where young men can't even bring a lawyer um, right. to defend themselves, and these the, the the individuals who are standing trial are giving these these uh, this education to always believe the accuser, and. I mean, it's basically a kangaroo court, and the the uh, the person like. who's being accused can't can't confront, or the the person the defendant can't confront their accuser, can't have a lawyer. The people that they're that the people that the young man is in front of are all trained, or have been lectured by uh, sexual assault um, members of the sexual the, the sexual grievance industry on campus to mm. to. In, in the mythology that women are, you know, female rape victims are, there's prejudice against them and you should always listen and believe. So it's like, it's, it's, it's stacked up again. And then they're also changing 
the rules that young men have to adhere to to avoid a charge of sexual assault. I mean, now in California, I think it's enthusiastic consent standard. If you can't prove that the that your partner gay granted you an uh, enthusiastic consent at every step of the way, then you can be charged with rape. And it's, nobody has that kind of proof. I don't have that kind of proof. For the last time that I had sex no. with my husband, that he was enthusiastically consenting, um, I don't have any proof of that. Um, because uh, there was no there was no recording of it. There was no you know. And, and if you have to actually produce proof, these men are, these young men are screwed. Right. Unless they recorded the entire encounter, and then then you get into other legality exactly about recording about recording and the so. you know the ethics of that and it's it's just it's getting to be absurd and it it's is. really obvious that these laws and these these policies are coming into place simply to punish male sexuality for existing exactly and that's that's what i see overall now i i see that that the mattress girl incident is a subset of that and like i said my impression off of her was that she may have actually been sexually abusive towards him. And uh, um, and I don't want to stand too much behind that because I'd have to re-look at everything again. But this seems to me like she's managed to create a way to re continue to re-victimize uh, her victim through this. Wow. Yeah, and that's that's the feeling I get, which, you know what, feelings are not worth a hell of a lot. <laughs> but that is the feeling I get off of that. Um and it's just, and that's the other thing. I mean, and the the whole the feminist uh, narrative protects this, and this like psychologically psychological abuse of men, basically. Well, it protects this whole situation where we see male sexuality as something that's predatory and evil and destructive that needs to be corralled and. Um, and uh, that it, I mean, what does the enthusiastic consent law really say? It I'm, says no right. woman would really consent. It seems like it's a war, like a feminist war. Liter and I say feminist because it not because it's necessarily only feminists who do this, because conservatives also seem to have a real unpleasant relationship with male sexuality as yeah. well. But it's feminists right now who are pushing the idea that. A woman, it's almost unbelievable to them that a woman would consent. It, it seems like it's less of a war on rape and a war on, than a war on consent. Mm. You cannot conceive of the idea that a woman would consent to having sex with a man. And unless, and, 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 and they're making it more and more difficult to, for a woman to consent to having sex with a man. Um, and I know that sounds strange, but now a woman not only can't just starfish. <laughs> well, she, you know, she probably shouldn't be uh, in the first. But now she has to be completely enthusiastic throughout the entire encounter, she, and it has to be recorded. And it's like it's, it's getting more and more and more, um, more difficult for a woman to consent. If you look at it that way, there's more there's more hurdles to a woman consenting to a man. So it feels like they're just lifting the bar higher and higher to what is acceptable consent. Now, they're putting the responsibility on the man, which is totally unfair. Um, and But on the other hand, they really are making it more and more difficult for a woman to express consent. Ah. And, um, and you know, that's, that's going to end up having an effect, I think, on relationships between men and women. And I would like to point out that prior to all of this hysteria, there this is not uh, this like what they're doing is actually very traditionalist because there used to be breach of promise laws, where a man could go to jail for having cons even consensual sex with a woman, if he failed to uh, provide for her the the relationship that she thought she would get out of the encounter, or what? whatever she thought that she would get out of the encounter. She would that's a breach of promise, and that, those were. Uh, I, Frank Sinatra, I think, went to jail for for a breach of promise law, um, and uh, so that that was on the books, I think, until the '60s. And so, I mean, this is this this is this is essentially a resurgence. This is essentially bringing back breach of promise laws in in hiding it behind rape legislation. And it's it's like, yeah, these are these are 
these are traditionalists. Uh. And they're going to bring back, they want to bring back the asymmetrical traditionalism. Like, uh, uh. anyway. <laughs> I was going like, to get, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I was going to get into this later, but I think I, this is a good deviation for it now. Um, what do you think is going on now? Is it more of a psychological thing or a government thing or a little bit of both when it comes to how people are reacting to um, these type of situations? Um, which type? You mean like a rape? rape? Yeah. Case? Well, or I think it's any a, type of crime that women consider against women in general. I think it's a hysteria. Okay. Um, and I think it's it's actually harming everyone. Um. People are engaging in like a almost a hysterical like a drug addiction. It's it it seems like society is addicted to outrage. Yeah, oh, oh, exactly right. And they feed their outrage addiction with these stories, and they don't care who gets destroyed in the in the process. Mm. And then the other thing is that this addiction to outrage that women have, um that many women have is so it's limiting to them as people because they become focused on this idea of being defined by how they're acted upon by men um, and obsessed with this idea of being defined about by how they're acted upon by men instead of how they act or they take action in their lives, which is an incredibly de- disempowering position for women to be in. And exactly. all this, this media this media circus around and this hysteria and this this propaganda to promote this idea of women being defined by being victims is not helping. <laughs> it's, it's literally like a cult of victimology. It's like it's turned into a religion of just being a victim. Yeah, and it's it's like that's that's their religious ecstasy is the outrage of, of being violated. This it's and it's so it's so in my opinion it's really self defeating. Very. And it's it like and I would say that. The, the this rise of the cult of the victim of victimhood and outrage culture probably explains why between 1985 and 2015 mm-hmm. the number of women in STEM fields and that's science technology engineering mathematics has gone down 20%. Wait, it went I mean, down? I thought it was yeah. like staying steady. No, it went down. Oh. It used to be I think it used to be at around 38%, and it went down to under 20. I did not know so that. 40% of the people in STEM fields in the 1980s were women. Um, so that means that in the 19... Uh, and if it was... If that was... That, that was in the 1980s, that means that... Um, that women had matured into those roles. You know what I mean? I mean, you start out as a, a student... And then you take a job. Um, so if and okay. uh, and if they're forty percent, that means they were forty percent throughout most of the the different positions. Um, in our different element, you know, different life, the life cycle of a career, which means we were doing something right. Not even in nineteen eighty five, we were doing something right in nineteen fifty five, nineteen sixty five, nineteen seventy five that we stopped doing. And in other words, women were making progress and the modern feminism actually brought them back under the guise that they brought progress. We can't say definitively that it was modern feminism, but somehow uh, we were doing something right in the 1950s and 1960s and started to falter. And and something manifested in the 1980s and things started to go wrong. Mm. if, if If you hold this to be a... A goal that you want, which feminists do, more women in STEM. We did. We started to do something very, very wrong. Um, I probably, if you, and if you, like again, it's it's difficult to understand these these trends because the 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 movement of people through their lives. So there's not like a one to one correspondence. So right. if you see something happening in in the schools in the 70s, you're not going to see it in the in the actual in the actual field until those people graduate, right? Right. So it's going to have a delayed response. Mm-hmm. So whatever was happening in the 80s probably was happening a decade prior when those women who started to drop off in the late 80s, the 90s, uh, the noughties, um, were starting to go through school. Mm. So we're probably looking at something that started in the 70s. Wow. And there are some things that started in the 70s that start with F. 
<laughs> that were that were that uh, functionally, if you if you look at the psychology, the science of psychology, mm -hmm. if you promote people viewing themselves as being acted upon, we have this sort of schism in our mind. It's called moral typecasting, and it's uh, there's actual psychological research behind it. We tend to put people into two categories: actors and people who can take who are people who can take action. And in that category are both people who we think take negative action, which are villains, and positive action, which are heroes. These are called moral agents, we, we, and we see them as having effect on the world around them. And then, in the other category, is people who are acted upon, right. moral patients, people who receive other people's action, or the, the actions of the moral agents. So if you create an ideology or uh, an ideology, if you wanted, or if you want, it, let's, let's look at the effect. The effect is less women go into challenging subjects, mm -hmm. which are STEM fields. Now, if you wanted to f make that happen with a group of people, and you, and you had some constraints, because you can't just tell them, no, you're, you're not allowed to go into those fields, because that's too obvious. That's, right. You can't make... You can't make uh, laws, you can't make social policy to exclude them, whatever. If you wanted to keep, keep that group of people out of a field that's challenging and requires a belief in one's sense of self and agency and effective ability to surmount problems, what you do is you promote the learned helplessness of seeing yourself as an eternal victim. Ugh. Yeah, and, and that's, that is consistent with a lot of the feminist narrative that right. started to come pumped out over and over again. Women are victims of society. Women are victims of, of STEM fields. Women are victims of the wage gap. Women are victims. Women are victims. Women are victims. So constantly over and over 24 again. 24 7. Yeah, you're emphasizing the idea that women are primarily defined by being acted upon. So what we did right in, in the 50s and the 60s, we started to do wrong in the 70s and the 80s, and we and then women just self-selected out of those fields that required uh, not even just a, a normal belief in one's agency, but a like science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Those are hard subjects. Right. You have to really be able to make the connection between your actions and their effects, because in many cases, it doesn't matter how smart you think you are. In college, if you want to get through those subjects, you have to do the work, which means you have to believe that when you do the work, that results will happen. And that's the one thing, that's the one attitude that, that gets taken away from people when they learn that learned helplessness of being a moral patient, of being seen as a victim. Mm. I don't know, Susie, uh, if, she's, if, if Susie is taught that she is defined by how everyone acts upon her, and she has then she and she has no ability to take effective change to change who she is or what she's capable of because she's mostly defined by what is done to her mm. or what she's received passively in terms of so-called gifts like uh, you you're a girl you can do anything because you're a girl that's a passive receiving of someone's uh, like a gift like you can't change the fact you're a girl Mm -hmm. Like that, that's passive. So you just receive the ability to do anything because you're a girl. That's passive. Um, so when you teach Susie shit like that, can I say shit? Yeah, you can. When you teach her shit like that, when she encounters something hard, <laughs> she has nothing in her exactly. in her toolbox to deal exactly. with. Exactly. She encounters something hard, and maybe she's been told her whole life, oh, you're a very bright little girl, and little girls can do anything they want. Well, what, what, what do you do when, if you've been told that your whole life when you encounter something you can't do? There's nothing in there to explain what to do, so you give up. Ugh. But if we're, but boys, on the other hand, are told, you know, you have to work hard for what you get. And, and they're also told that... Um, well, they'll get a different message, and it's pretty. In, in many ways, it's emotionally crippling message too. Uh. They'll be told that um, nothing, what they get as a boy, is is a huge debt of moral sin. So that they, they actually get um, all kinds of. Uh, well, they 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 inherit the sin of of violence against women. 
and that they have to constantly be on guard least they least they fall into that sinful state so but they're but in in saying that to the boys they're actually emphasizing their role as taking a choice it's sick it's probably the sickest way to do it but it's still emphasizing the idea that boys have a choice to make uh-huh. where girls just exist and are acted upon by boys boys have a moral choice to make in regards to their relationship with girls that girls do not have to make in regards to the relationship with boys because they're purely defined by being acted upon by those boys. So having learned all of this stuff, Susie is not going to see her choices and actions as having any effect on the world. So if she's going to encounter calculus, for example, when I encounter calculus, most mathematics had come easy to me. Hmm. Um, but calculus, no. It was extremely difficult for me to wrap my mind around it. So what I did, and I remember this in high school, is I said, okay, the only way I'm going to understand this is if I do the work. So I would stay after school for hours just working on calculus, um, trying trying to force myself to understand it. And other girls would simply give up. Because they didn't make the connection between this hard subject matter and their own ability to tackle it and solve it. I mean, it wasn't a situation where it was going to come easy, and I knew it wasn't going to come easy. Uh But I also knew that if, with time and effort, my actions would would yield rewards in terms of understanding it. Whereas this other way that that girls are raised, um, like I said, I'm, I'm using Susie, but she's been told her whole life everything she gets is a passive attribute of something she can't change, and also she's primarily being acted upon. There's nothing in there to tell her that, hey, your actions matter, your choices matter, your choices have effect on the world. Therefore, if you choose to sit and work three hours after school every day on calculus, you will most likely get it. Uh. Well, the boys have been told, yes, your choices matter. You have this moral choice to make, or you have this, you have to work to get what you want, you, and you have these moral choices to make. Your choices and actions will affect the world around you. And I, I don't know if I'm explaining it well enough. Oh, no, that's fine. But, um, <laughs> I've just gone on a huge tangent. That's, that's, I actually appreciate that. I want the huge tangents, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's, they will act. You know, Susie and Tommy. You teach Susie that she's acted upon by Tommy, and that's her primary definition, and she won't understand. She won't make the connection between her actions and the greater world, or her actions and benefiting herself, or her actions and and serving other people morally. Her actions are anything. She'll live basically in a state of of limbo, Uh. where she doesn't think she can affect any effective change. And conversely, if you tell Tommy, well, you ha- you're responsible, you've inherited this, this, this body of sin, and you have to constantly guard against your moral choices because you have such an enormous and profound effect on Susie that mm-hmm. you can't even imagine, like, you sneeze wrong and she'll just die. <laughs> you know, he's going to have this idea uh... that, that his, his choices and actions... I mean, it's a huge guilt to bear, but it at is. the other hand, he's going to have this idea that his choices and actions are really what defines the world. Uh. Um, and he's going to he's going to respond in that in that way. He's going to say, "You know what? This this is this subject is hard, but I can choose because I've been emphasized my whole life that I do have the choice and my choices are powerful. I can choose to to do the work." Whereas Susie's going to say, "Well, I don't I not, my choices are meaningless, so I'm going to just I just must be stupid." And this is this is this is this is the this is how highly they, destructive. Yeah, it's really destructive. It's really toxic. It, it is. And it's 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 not fair to girls, and it's sure as hell is not fair to boys because no. they don't deserve to bear that amount of guilt. And there seems like there it's there must be an easier way, because I mean that's twenty percent. Um, I mean, even if you if you believe in the in the dist- well, of course, there's a distribution of intelligence between men and women. Women tend to cluster around the middle. Right. There's still twenty percent of of women, um, and I assume that the women who would have gone on this stem would have been the higher end mm-hmm. of their intelligence distribution. That's still like 
you've reduced the body of intelligent people that you can draw from for these positions. I don't know if that matters, but it, it seems like it's a waste of, and not only is it, not only is it crippling boys and men emotionally, it's wasting women's potential. <laughs> and it's slowing down the progress of society in general. Yeah. It's like, it's just, it's just suck all around. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not sure why we need to continue it. Like, what is this necessary? Is it? Uh, whatever. I guess so. To some people, it is. So, in essence, if we could summarize that particular part, you could say men feel overly burdened with trying to control everything and everyone around them, not just themselves, and women feel like they have to give up, that they have no power whatsoever. And because of that, both of them are not making the strides forward that they should be making. Yeah, I think so. Um, mm. You can summarize it that way. Um, I think that uh, feminists allow women... You're dropping out. I can't quite hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, I think that feminists allow women... Can you hear me now? You sound a little bit further away. I'm not sure what it is, but it's like the volume went down. Really? Is it bad still? Uh, a little bit. You were much louder before. <laughs> I might need to move into another area. Okay. So just give me a second. No problem. I might have to move into the room where my husband is playing again. <laughs> I gotta move in here because uh, the sound is dropping out. Oh. So. Now you sound better. Okay, good. Can uh, you keep the volume down? Uh, you uh, not really. Okay. All right. So, it, I mean, I guess feminists give women the right to uh, to complain. <laughs> oh God. And then they consider that empowerment. Because complaining really is asking someone else to do something, and, and exactly. in, in the essence of complaining is the is the understanding that the other person can do something and you can't. <laughs> so it's, it's still a disempowerment. <sighs> Being angry is actually also a disempowerment. Like women, uh, feminists say that men, women should be angry, but the the anger is this expectation is this still this expectation that men should have done something for them. Well, that's still saying that men have the ability that you don't. And it's still buying into that sort of inferiority complex. Now, I mean, there is legitimate anger, but at some point you got to say, hey, how much of this stuff should I really have done for myself? <sighs> you know, anyway. Uh, that's a perfect segue to my next point. Um, so would you say you studied like male and female psychology? Um, like from layman's terms or no? Nah? Um, I haven't actually done a lot of studies into male and female psychology. Oh, okay. Uh, I think Karen has done more. Okay. Uh, I've actually done more. Like, the thing is that I I do a lot. Like, I've read a lot more about philosophy, which I've, and I've done some, some, some work into psychology. Mm. But not specifically male and female psychology and how they differ. Uh, hmm. Maybe I should do that. I'm not sure. <laughs> the, reason I was, uh, the reason I was asking is because um, going back to the whole rape situation of college campuses, it's uh, like, are there actual college tribunals that the college controls the courtroom, or, or am I mistaken? Well, these are lay like these. This is not the courtroom. This is this. Yeah, is, what are those? That sounds yeah, very tribunal for for uh, student behavior. So wow. they they can. They can do punishments like refusing degrees, um, uh, expelling students, stuff like that. And they can also do things like forcing them out of classes and other stuff. That's, so it's not... It's that not, sounds very totalitarian and backward, but okay. Yeah, well, it is. And, yeah. That, but they're not like punishments like going to jail or being on a sex offender registry. Okay. So it's not quite a court, but it is... They they are pretty. They have some pretty severe and, and lasting can, um, effects on on these students' uh, college careers because they not if they get expelled for a sexual charge from one college, it's entirely possible that you will not get into another, and wow. that your your uh, your record will be permanently altered by that. So uh, I mean, this is this can end a person's career or a man's career. Jesus. So it, it's a pretty severe situation just to be put to have a bunch of people who have no criminal law background, 
like no no background into this kind of judicial procedures that they're just a bunch of professors um in many cases drawn from like gender studies making these decisions and making them based on not on like a preponderance of the F R, not on like a, a beyond a reasonable doubt standard yeah but be, but on a standard like 50 50 plus point zero one percent of the evidence suggests which could be just she says it and he, he she says yes it happened he says no it didn't it could be as simple as that and then the other thing is that um oh shoot i had another thing and then it sort of disappeared because people in steam are messaging me uh-huh. just a second let me let me just focus for a second and see if i can find it uh-huh. um so you have a situation where they're able to do oh yeah they can expel a student. They can. They they ha, They actually have a lower standard of evidence to expel a student for for rape than stealing a pack of gum, or 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 or, or, or um, punishing a student for stealing a pack of gum. That's still like um, the 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 preponderance of the evidence, which I think is seventy five percent plus to to punish a student for stealing a pack of gum. But to punish a student for for rape is is now just uh, the the majority of the evidence. Are these tribunals mostly female? Or are they mixed? Or is it even? I don't know. Nobody really knows. Oh. I mean, some some Dang. of our viewers and listeners have suggested the only way that men are going to get out of this is if they start actually charging women on campus with rape, which is it's actually pretty legitimate possibility well it's like oh i know you're talking about like start doing to them what's happening to the no, men that way they understand it them. not even doing to them because the the reality is if you look at the statistics right um for college boy or like high school boys and college age men right um i've seen studies that suggest between something like 42 to like 50 so, so 40 to 50 percent of them report having been either sexually assaulted or raped 95 percent of them by a, a woman now they don't say rape because most men are like no i was not even if even if the woman you know had him at knife point they wouldn't say it mm. uh, be, it's it's just that stigma but um they they if you ask them did were you physically forced into having sex they'll say yes but if you, you ask them well were you raped they'll I'll say, say no, no. <laughs> because well i mean because there's this huge thing where we don't see that men can be raped. I mean, there's no social, there's no narrative around that for men to connect the word rape with being physically forced to have sex, particularly by a woman. And mm. so you have this high rate of sexual abuse going on, uh, directed at college men, and so they don't have to actually lie or make false accusations. Right. They just have to start reporting the stuff that's actually happening to them, and mm. it would it would probably change things. Mm. Or, or they would just be ignored. Who knows? I mean, it, 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 it would probably... Uh, the, the, the problem with college campuses is what is what I'm... What suggested to me from the statistics is that you have this culture of, of excessive drinking oh and, and having sex with people and, and considering it appropriate. So I, I think that some, some educational... Um, materials would would might work but the problem is that that this entire culture is um the individuals engaging in this casual hookup culture they seem to want to do that that's that's what they want to do like i remember there was an article on the good man good man um pay uh the good man project where a guy confessed to having sex with women who were for who were really drunk to the point where they couldn't really um, say yes or no, or no. But he also said that that had happened to him. Well, he, he implied that that had happened to him as well. Mm. So it's like this cyclical culture of taking advantage of people too drunk to say no. And it's sort of, uh. it's like, how do you, how do you break into that and tell these people that they're fucking themselves up? Right. And if it is, and if they want to do it, if, if it is like almost like a unwritten code that this is something that they're actually into, I don't know. It, it, it's 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 more complicated than simply saying that it's men preying on women. Right. 
obviously uh, it obviously is a cycle of of prey of men preying on women women preying on men and then also some sort of consensual crap going on um and then also um just innocent people getting caught in the mix and it's it's sort of a fucked up culture anyway that's uh but it, but that men wouldn't have to actually lie or make false accusations they could just bring forward the, the, the issues that they're already facing already mm. completely honestly <laughs> and, uh, and, and challenge this. And it, it seems so unfair that simultaneously men are going to be, can be, can be subject to false accusations and not just that, but subject to false accusations and then force like what really bakes my noodle is that there are guys who have been forced to have sex, or like phys- like forced, not physically forced, but psychological, and, and I think this is more like physical force or threats of violence. They've been forced to have sex by women by saying, if you don't have sex with me, I'll, give, I'll falsely accuse you of rape. <sighs> so it's like, this is, oh, that's just like, <sighs> that's in feminist. I'm like, you know, false rape accusations are, are sometimes the weapon that rapists use to extort compliance out of their victims. So I think that you know that there is no there's no dichotomy here. There isn't false rape accusations um, on one hand. We have to prioritize victims over of, of rape over victims of false rape accusations because often they're the same victim. Mm. And it's like you don't can't create the false dichotomy. This is this is a problem across the board. Um, it isn't false rape accusation victims against rape accusate rape victims. It's a problem that needs a holistic solution and care about both sets of victims and, and the fact that they also overlap quite a bit. And if you look at the situation, like if you look at the, the fallout for false rape accusations, right. victims of false rape accusations, the psychological fallout is almost identical to that of rape victims. Like that, it's they, they have problems with relationships. Some of them can't have sex afterwards or they just they have problems trusting female partners. Um, there, there's depression, suicide, um, so, like sleep disturbances, um, work disturbances. I mean, the, the whole range of problems that men face after being falsely accused are identical to the range of psychological, nearly identical to the range of psychological problems that people face after having been raped. So the, the fact that, that we're, we're taking these two populations who are subject to sexual violence. Right. And separating them and then saying, yeah, you fight to the death is just sick. It's more nuanced than that. It's not this two-sided thing that they're trying to make no, it out to be. Not. It's not. Mm. And it's it's disturbing that they would do that. But maybe we should move on to another topic. Mm, uh, okay. Um, so would that, you, Oh, go ahead. That's that's one of the topics that like uh, sexual violence and and I think it's I think actually that false rape accusations are a subset of sexual violence is is one of my personal hobby horses. No, I don't know if I want to call it hobby horses. My personal concerns in this. So mm. I don't know how much you want me to yap on that one. Uh, you want to go ahead or want to move to another topic? No, let's move to another topic. I uh, think I've said my piece. <laughs> okay. Um, so would you say that society's like, would you say that society is getting more feminized both socially and in the justice system, or no? I don't know if I want to use the word feminized. Like Infantilized? Just, um, uh, yeah, infantilized, definitely. Okay. Um, yeah. the, the problem that I have with it is, um, I don't, I think it's a bad idea to associate femininity or femaleness with a uh, lack of moral agency, just simply because if, if you give women an out, uh, I mean, if you give any group of people an out, they'll take hmm. it. They'll be as lazy as you let them be. So if you associate oh, um, oh, okay. integrity and um, a certain amount of moral courage exclusively with masculinity um, instead of it with adulthood, mm. then what will end up happening is you'll, you'll see that women don't embody those traits. And I think it's the the bigotry of soft expectations. But to say that, I I do think that there's a lot of infantilization going on in our culture. And I think it benefits the people in charge quite a bit. Yes, it does. Because it it simultaneously makes people easy to control and full of needs that can be fulfilled by large institutions, either corporate or uh, Or government. government. Yeah. So that's my opinion on that. (laughs) 
And to go back to the um, the tribunal thing, it's like, like, have you ever noticed how it seems like women, especially today, they seem to like run away from problems, whereas men still kind of face problems? Um, and would you say like yeah. these certain parts of society are starting to act more like how women will respond to certain situations or challenges? Um, I think that that is also, it's a, I've been reading a lot about how we, how we've changed our moral approaches over the generations. Yeah. In Today's previous. moral approaches suck, but go ahead. In previous generations, we would focus more on the idea that we, that each individual sort of has their own moral in previous generations, we didn't exclude women from this this discussion about sin. Like women were were also considered fallen, and I, and now this is a very Christian and conservative way of looking at it. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't want to I don't want to emphasize the religious aspects. I want to emphasize the psychological aspects. Right. Both girls and boys were basically taught, and I think probably boys more than girls, but still, girls were still taught that there was that they were innately sinful. And that they had to keep that under control. So they were both taught that they were moral agents making moral choices. And then we changed in the in the forties and fifties and sixties to start to say that all of our natural impulses are perfectly good. That goodness isn't choice. Goodness is just something we passively receive from just I don't know, whatever, just 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 being. Um, and. Uh, but we still retained a lot of that teaching for boys that they were moral agents, that you, you, you're fallen and you have to choose to be better than your fallen state. Whereas with girls, you're just perfect by virtue of having a BJJ. Mm. And uh, so I think that that, that sort of um, made society lose a lot of its, I think, moral, moral potency. Um, not, not that necessarily teaching people that they are sinful and fallen and need to guard against that, but teaching people that they are moral agents and they are capable of evil, you know, and that it's their choice to turn to the light or it's their choice to turn to the dark. Um, I'm not, sh- I, I don't know if I'd have to really think about, about teaching people that they're fallen, if that actually is of benefit psychologically. Cause sometimes the way religion structures, even though religion is is has no no real logical or or at least factual basis, right? A lot of what they did made a lot of sense in the context of of where it was created. It it made sense in in creating people who could live with each other in these environments, um, and what we're seeing now is this complete lack of this inward focus of morality, like. You have to actually choose to be moral, and it's more like you you you, you don't you just morality now is about self expression, <laughs> and it's like ah no that's not really morality. Morality is hard. It's hard choices. It's hard work. It's 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 getting up and deciding not to be a shit, right? Or not you know? to be weak, or not to be dishonest, or whatever it is. Yeah, it's 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 all it's a it's a choice, and when you take that choice, when you say that women are like I said, when you when you define women as being as not being moral agents, and this is what they, we have done in previous generations prior to this one, we define women as moral agents to a degree, maybe less of a degree than men, but we still define them as moral agents. When you stop defining girls as moral agents, when you when you give them this enormous goddamn victim complex that they're they're not they're they're naturally endowed with all this fucking goodness. And it's only society that's suppressing them and making them evil. It, you completely and utterly destroy them as moral agents. Mm. And this is what we see. You know, and I, and I think that if you looked at women prior to these generations where we've completely destroyed women as moral agents, I don't think you would see women who necessarily ran away from problems. You know, I, I, I think that, you know, if you, if you go back far enough, you're, you're probably going to see women who were very capable of dealing with problems. I mean, hell, look at the 50s and the women who were in the, the auxiliary corps, you know, going through soldier training. I mean, they look like they're, you know, they, they're like 17, 16, 17 year old women. And they look like they've got it more on together than a 35 year old cat lady. <laughs> 35 year old today. You know, or any of the girls on Tumblr, they look like they they know what the sh- oh. you know they know their shit. 
Um, and you don't see that. You don't see that kind of self-possession anymore. And it's like, and it's unfortunate too, because without that kind of self-possession, girls become very easily manipulated. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I personally don't think that male sexuality is toxic in any sense of the word. Um, but you, you, you end up when you, when you, when you teach girls to not take responsibility as moral agents and to exteriorize their sense of control, their locus of control, you teach them to be easily manipulated by anybody. Mm. And that's what I see. I mean, you look back in the fifties and you look at the women and I was like looking at these women training in the auxiliary and I was like, these women wouldn't be easily manipulated. <laughs> They knew what was important. They had their priorities. Right. You know, had a core of, of a moral expectation and an understanding of themselves as agents. And you can see it in their demeanor that is com- that you don't see anymore. Uh, with, with, with these Tumblr um, or these young women, mm-hmm. not all of them, but a lot of them, you just see this kind of, and it's encouraged. You see this kind of lack of, of having that core, and I, I, I'm sounding like some old fogey. All no, you're not. It's, it's common sense. At least to me, it is. All the young people, they don't know a damn thing. And the funny thing is that, actually, I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily the really young women. I think it's women about, uh, I don't know, 25 to mid age at this point. Uh, even a little older, because I think younger women. When you get younger, you are starting to get into the women who are shaped more by games which do require someone to understand themselves in terms of their actions which mm. is what's interesting about games because you, you don't get anywhere unless you do I mean, you games can't... as in you mean like video games or board games yeah. or mind games or what video games oh video games okay i mean if you think about it you log on to a video game if you you sit there thinking well i'm completely defined by what's done to me nothing's gonna happen oh that's a good oh, okay that's a good point okay okay so you, when you're in a video game, you're incentivized to make the connections between your actions and consequences. In fact, right. that's what the video game teaches you, is make connections between actions and consequences. If you do it right, you have a great game. So women who are into that gaming culture, which tend to be very young, much younger, they're making those connections. And I think that they are creating a different approach to, to um, the world around them. Um, and maybe they're filling in for some of those moral gaps because they're learning or at least interested in making the connection between their actions and their consequences. And the natural, I think a natural outgrowth of being interested in action and consequences, eventually you start to, to want to think about morality. What actions do I want to take to affect good consequences? Mm. Uh, because it's, 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 it's attractive. Like it's, it's a, speaking as somebody who, who, a woman who really likes to see the effects of her actions, it's attractive to see positive outcome versus negative outcome. And the more you see your actions in terms of being agentative, it's, it's like that, the psychology, moral typecasting. We do that to ourselves as well. The more we see our actions as having big consequences, I think the more we get concerned about how those consequences affect others uh, by simple virtue of, of seeing ourselves as, ha- as being more agentative. We, we don't see ourselves. When you, when, you, when you feel like you have, a big conse- you have big consequences to your actions, you take yourself out of the realm of being acted upon. Right. And then you start seeing how your actions affect others. And what, what's interesting about people who are, are generally very evil – quote unquote I wouldn't say evil but just sort of nasty people right. is that they play the victim really well <laughs> even though they can be stabbing yeah. someone they could, they could literally be thinking that they are the victim of the person they're stabbing you notice that? I, I have noticed that yeah that's, yeah, a, that's a relatively common thing so when when you make that connection between the consequences of your actions and um the con- your, your actions and their consequences and the consequences are usually to other people if you really are making that connection it becomes very I think it becomes very difficult to actually not be interested in the morality of your actions mm. well that's, yeah, that's, that a, that's a philosophical sense. concept so I'll just put that out there I, I, I don't I, I would have to look into it more to figure out the support for that 
But okay. I would say that, um, for example, one, one, one thing that might tangentially support it is um, if you look at the records of deaths of soldiers in World War I, right. you'll find that the highest rate of death was um, field officers, uh, lieutenants to captains. They died more than any other rank. More than enlisted men, so that's uh, sergeant, private, corp, uh, corporal. Um, they, they, the, 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 the officers would in the field, seeing direct combat, died at almost twice the rate as the men they commanded. Um, and I think that is moral typecasting in effect. Mm. When you take on the role of having responsibility over other people, you put yourself almost in the role of parent. And there's there's a I think there's a psychological role, like there's there's almost like a, a I don't know like a maybe a, an instinctual evolved hormonal profile that we enter when we when we conceive of ourselves as being in a parent role over other people, mm. where we start to treat ourselves as being more expendable. So, I think that's what happened there is that they they enter the role of moral agent over their own men. And they start to treat themselves as more expendable because they don't see their own, how they're being acted upon anymore as much as they see how their men are being acted upon. And that becomes more important to them than how they're being acted upon. So they take on the more dangerous role hmm. to protect. So, yeah, that's, that's my thoughts. But, um, and I think that I, I'd like to see that examined more scientifically. I, okay. If that, if, that, if that is a true effect, that when people take on, start to see themselves in a more, uh, a more potent role, like a, having more consequence to their actions, a more agentative role, when people start seeing themselves in that role, do they treat themselves as more expendable relative to people that they see as being in a more passive role, regardless of who they are? Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Um... Well, there's another there's another tangential thing that might support that as well. Oh, you did, go, go ahead. No, I, we're at the hour, but they they did a study on um, speed dating, and Oof. they found that women were more choosy than men, which is typical. Yeah. But when they switched it up so that men approached, like what they did is they had in one group men approached women. Um, so men were the ones who had to get up and go to the next table. You know how speed dating goes? You, yeah. You, series of, of stations or whatever. Mm -hmm. So men would be the ones who had to get up and go to the next station. Right. So they would always be approaching. And in the other group, they had the women get up and go to the next station. Mm-hmm. What found is that in the groups where the women got up and approached, and were where the men became more choosy. The women stayed as choosy as they always were in, in both cases, but the men became more choosy when they started to be approached. Mm. It's almost like in the process of becoming um, less the agent in the situation, less the person who does the action of approaching, mm -hmm. the men started to value themselves more. Yeah. Which is, which is, which is interesting, considering that the cultural norms force, basically, I guess, force men, or maybe just biological imperative whatever <sighs> but anyway um it's a, it's an hour now so i don't know if you want to go any further with this no i, I keep uh yeah we can keep going um uh i'm getting a little tired though uh, uh, uh let me see how much longer do you think you can go like maybe 10 15 more minutes sure do you have a few more questions like clear questions that you'd like to know uh yeah I just want to know your opinion on, um, are you aware of MGTOW? Yeah, men going their own way, yep. So, like, what's your opinion on the men that are going in that direction in response to the feminist society that we live in? Well, I think that if it's, I mean, it's their decision, ultimately. I don't really mm -hmm. think I have much of an opinion on it. I think it's okay. a valid decision for somebody to make um, in the context of the society as it is. I wouldn't blame anyone who doesn't want to get married or mm -hmm. even cohabit with a woman. It, considering the the one sided laws that have right. been created, uh, so I, I other than that I don't really have an opinion on it. I mean I think I think that's a perfectly legitimate response. The situation that we're in. Um, okay. Uh, uh, okay, I do sorry. this quickly. But um, sorry. five things that I think women need to understand about men, but they don't. 
Okay. These are just my five that I came up with. But, um, mm-hmm. one, men don't want to attack women. Two, men do and feel pain and fear. They just handle it differently. Three, men need intimacy. Four, men have complex thoughts, way more complex than what society says we have. And five, men have to deal with rejection and pressures that women generally don't have to, do, don't have to deal with. Your thoughts? I, I would agree. Mm. Um, I would uh, I would agree that, the, and I would agree on number five, uh, I agree that women need to know that. They need to have it drilled into their heads mm. that men are are vulnerable, that they have pain. And that, and I also like to add to the intimacy thing that I think men in many cases experience intimacy as if as, as not, I, I, what I want to say is that men experience their emotions physically. Mm. Um, in other words, they process them physically. So it's, it's uh, when, when you say that men just want sex, that's like saying men just want love because that's the physical manifestation or processing of love. So it's 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 so trivializing, um, and and that's what that from my observations of men, men are really prone to need to process their emotions through their physicality. So mm. yeah. if you deny them that and you don't recognize that that's how men do that, then you're denying a huge portion of their emotional being, and you're belittling it by saying, "Oh, it's just a physical thing." Well. Emotion is just a physical thing too. It's just a phys- physical expression. It goes both ways. But the the other thing I would say is that yes, men have to deal with pressures and rejections that women don't, and uh, and it's un- really unfortunate. And I think it's really unfortunate for women too, because living in this limbo of being, uh, I would say, depersoned. When, when you when you have you can't take any action that has any meaningful consequence um, mm-hmm. rejection and pressure also create the idea that men's actions have consequences without that women's actions don't matter mm-hmm. they might as well be meaningless and mm-hmm. I, I like to use an analogy um, in the 70s there was this push to do to revitalize uh, poor areas through using, what they call the international architectural style. And it's this enormous monolithic, ugly shit that they would put into people, um, into poor people's areas to try to, you know, create more residences or, or services or whatever. And the people in those areas would do everything they could to deface it because it was so inhuman. And so it had no mark of them on it and they had to live in it. And the reason why is because when you see this, it, it, it has no it has no relation to you. You're, you're in this world that has absolutely no relation to you. Your urge is to want to put a mark on it that it, to say, you know, I was here, I existed in this space. Um, you want to feel like you your action, like you have some sort of presence in the world around you, and you know, and it would deface this stuff. And that's the situation where we put women in. They have absolutely no effect on the world around them. And, and it's, it's being put in that situation and they can't even deface anything because they, they, it'll just be erased and covered over and it'll just become you know, the same, same faceless blank wall of concrete. So no matter how much they fight against it, they have absolutely no effect on or we, we as a society have decided to completely expunge any woman any women's effect on society just just hide it from view no matter how violent or aggressive or or destructive it becomes it just gets erased the next day so it's like women are living in almost a reverse isolation tank and some of them are going completely fucking nuts (laughs) oh god but it's it and and again i don't want to de-stress i don't want to say that men are not the shit under the stick with this, with the pressures and and the responsibilities and the rejection. Um, but if you look at it the other way, being thrown in an isolation tank where nothing you do personally can impact the world around you because it's immediately erased from view mm. is also shit. 
It would be nice to meet in the middle. Mm. Nice to meet in the middle. So relieve some of the burden off of men and give women something that they can push against so that they feel real. Now, don't you live in Canada? Yeah, I do. Now, is feminism like more intense there or is it just me? It seems like it's way more intense, like the women are more... I've had, like, a lot of different theories on it. I think one of them is that yeah, it's weird. we don't have as much of a traditionalist or, or like, more of a fundamentalist Christian uh, base. So the feminism is uh, maybe more obvious or just the, the gynocentrism and feminism goes a little bit crazier because it doesn't it have any... very to... insane. Like, there's something not right about them mentally. It's, uh... Well, it's like they can go where... I think it's, like... There's there's two branches of what I would consider gynocentrism mm -hmm. in the U.S. There's more of a fundamentalist Christian gynocentrism, and then there's the 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 feminist gynocentrism. Mm. Surprisingly, in some ways, they're surprisingly similar because they both emphasize the idea that women are the weaker vessel, mm. except when feminists say we're the oppressed vessel, and and fundamentalists say that they're the the vessel that should submit. And in both cases, by adopting the role of the vulnerable party, they, they, they occupy the cent the moral center of their society. That's how it works. Mm. When you become when you become perceived as more vulnerable because of moral typecasting, everybody else's actions revolve around how they affect you. So that's that's gynocentrism in a nutshell. You make you make the public perception of women as more vulnerable then everyone's actions will revolve around how they affect women. Um, and you can see that in fundamentalism with the submission, submission wife, submitted wife, weaker vessel uh, rhetoric. And you see that in feminism with the oppressed woman, a uh, male privilege patriarchy rhetoric, which is functionally identical. It may, may be slightly different in terms, but it's functionally identical rhetoric. It, all it does is put women in the, vul the vulnerable position uh. to occupy the moral center of society and make it so that everybody's everybody's actions revolve around how they benefit or don't benefit women. Now, and even if you look at how feminine or fundamentalist women ostracize each other, it's along the same lines too. If women are too free sexually with men, they're going to be ostracized. Same with That's feminine. True. If they're too free sexually with men, or if they're too free emotionally with men, with feminists, they're going to be ostracized. Uh. So it, functionally, I think it's very, they're very similar um, impulses. Um, now, having said that, I think that functionally in the past, Christians and more traditional societies worked simply because they still gave girls the moral imperative, but I think that sort of faded away in our current society. Uh, uh, mm. But the, 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 in the United States, there's the competition between the two, which may hold both in check more. In Canada, there is no competition. There's only one gynocentrism, and that's feminist. Wow. Uh, so they go. And they 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 have more of a free feel to to act upon. So that that's my uh, an idea that I have. I don't know if I want to advance it as something that I'm going to say. Yeah, hundred percent. This is what it is, or even ninety percent, or eighty, or seventy, or even fifty plus point zero one percent. Okay. So there you go. Uh, I had two more, but I'm going to try to combine them into one. Okay. And the question I have is, uh, what do you think is going to be the future of society with this problem? Is it going to be fixed? Is it going to get worse? What are people uh, going to do about it in the okay. next couple of decades? My personal opinion yeah. is that Gamergate is a harbinger of, of uh, what's going to happen. Gamergate, what's interesting about Gamergate is is that it has lasted for a year. And it has effectively, effectively resisted the um, the uh, the narrative of woman as victim, um, the the misogyny narrative. They've effectively resisted that essential gynocentrism that I t just told you about. This idea that women are vulnerable, therefore um, a culture, a society, a groups. Uh, actions and everybody's actions need to revolve around how they affect women. I never really followed Gamer Game. I'm still not sure exactly what it was. If you could summarize it kind of quickly, that'd be fine. Okay, well, essentially, there were some ethical breaches in gaming press. Um, gamers called the press out on those ethical breaches, mm. and the press turned around and called them misogynists. 
Uh, oh, okay. Oh. In order to silence them. Now, you could say that part of the problem was that there was a particular woman who was sleeping with, with um, a game developer who was sleeping with uh, Games Press, and they were covering her games uh, with an obvious conflict of interest. Oh, uh, so okay. That's, yes. that's some of the, the specifics. But the general thrust of this is gamers got tired of the unethical practices in games media and started to revolt against them and demand more ethics. And the games media turned around and called them misogynists. And then the greater media turned around and called them misogynists. And after being called a misogynist, they didn't back down. They kept going forward even after being called that, right? Yep, they kept, They just kept kept marching forward. Uh, okay. That, that is actually that one thing hmm. is amazing. Because before, you could totally shatter a group. I mean, atheism. You could totally shatter a group with the charge of misogyny. You could totally sever it and start to control it. Gamer Gators just kept marching forward and nice. started to get more connected and mm. more involved. So it's like, this is a vanguard, and it came from gaming, and I, I think it came from gaming precisely because in gaming, there is a core of female gamers, uh, I think this is one element, that resist the narrative, the gynocentric narrative of vulnerability. Because they define wow, themselves okay. their actions. That makes so, a lot of sense now. Okay. Yeah, so there will always be these women marching forward um, in Gamergate. It's not going to change. And there's going to be more of them. The more that women get involved in these kinds of media that teach them to focus on their actions as con and, and consequences of their actions and thus start revitalizing women as moral agents, the more they get involved in this, the larger and larger that group, that core group of women will be, and they, there's nothing in this society that can stop them. So they're just going to march forward. Um, they will continue to be called misogynists or internalized, having internalized misogyny because they don't submit to the, the identity of a vulnerable female, thus submit to being centered morally in society. Um, and, uh, well, cent to centered morally in society, and the and the the the, the uh, trade off is, of course, you no longer see yourself as an effective agent or a person at all. Really, mm. uh, you just become a you just become someone else's consequence. And they and female gamers resist that because okay. that's the nature of being a gamer is that you're interested in the consequences of your actions. That's what attracts you to gamers. Mm. See, so tell a female gamer that she's defined by being acted upon. When the very thing she seeks out and takes as an identity is wanting to see her co the consequences of her actions in a greater world. See what right, I'm saying? Right, she right. Female gamers' identity, gamers who happen to be female, their identity is to, as an agent. So they are the women who are going to most resist being cast as vulnerable centers of a more of a of a of a society that need you know everybody's actions need to be judged. So they just become a consequence to someone else. They're going to resist that, mm. and that's what we're seeing in Gamergate. I think that's why Gamergate has marched forward in the way that it has. Okay. Um, and I think that's going to continue to happen. And what's going to be interesting is that um, as the uh, as this particular medium grows, um, games and games are already huge, and they're gonna keep growing bigger. Yeah, it, we know that. Get, like this, games are cave paintings. Uh -huh. If you imagine just the first stirrings of understanding a visual language, games are games are cave paintings. They're the first stirrings of understanding the language. Uh, 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 that uh, I think what I would call a haptic language or a language of this interactive touch almost that is they're the first stirrings of understanding it mm. the cave painting is just the beginning because you go from a cave painting to pictographs which are words you know images that have words attached to them and then you've just expanded your society and your ability to organize and your ability to understand your ability to conceptualize and have cognition as a human being mm go from pictographs to alphabets and suddenly you get another huge expansion of our capabilities because now you you're not just you're not just talking about a written language um you're talking about the potential for empires for modern finance for navigating the globe mm. for creating like um banks uh, corporations you're talking about everything that underpins our society up to like the 1950s everything 
So from games or cave paintings, and then we're going to see progressive, um, ex progressive um, levels after that, just like you saw oh, with wow. the full sense. You go from, pict from cave paintings to pictographs to uh, alphabet to all okay. kinds of mathematical systems, philosophical systems, written systems, languages, everything. And that, that is going to just totally, it's, 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 <laughs> it, it, it's, these problems are going to just, we, won't, we probably won't even bother to remember them. Uh -huh. Huh. Um, so it's, that's what I see. Um, I don't know when it's going to happen. I okay. think Gamergate is the first vanguard of it. Um, they're the first people who are pushing back against a purely verbal, a uh, purely um, oral tradition. Uh, that's what I see, is that you have the people who see so much worth in, in the cave paintings, and they go out and they have to sneak out and look at them, because the, the, oh, the people who are embodying the oral tradition are incredibly suspicious of this bad spiritual magic or whatever you know and this is that's the kind of schism that i think we're seeing we're seeing a fundamental change in cognition some people are now able to comprehend the idea of information presented in a visual and not just oral system because before before we had visual information visual systems of information we just had oral systems of storytelling basically. storytelling yeah and i mean I mean, before that we just basically probably had smell and some basic grunting <laughs> So with an oral tradition, you can start having tribes, you know, you can start developing this idea of a lineage. Um, but I'd imagine that people who are steeped in the oral tradition would be very suspicious of the idea of a visual of information being conveyed visually because it, they, they wouldn't understand the abstraction off of the visual. You know what I mean? Right. And in, okay. in oral traditions, you're very much about spirits embodying everything. A visual tradition probably looked completely, um, like, just satanic to them. <laughs> like, you could see something in those scratches. Oh, my God, that's, like, almost satanic. Like, um, um, mm. that, that, that these, these scratches would have some sort of spirit that these other people are able to perceive, but they have no control over. And imagine in those kind of shamanistic societies, that would be horrifying to the powers that be. It would be. That, that makes total sense. It would be. So that's what I think is happening now. Is once again we're going through a shift. We have certain people who are fascinated by this new way of interacting, um, and there's there's this tension with the old realm, the, the old like, guard, right? Yeah, the old guard that was a purely visual medium. Like, and and again, I think that gamers are games are probably where cave paintings were at, and we're going to be looking at some even bigger changes as we start to see whatever um, cave paintings became pictographs. So games are going to become whatever is the correlation to pictographs. And then they're going to become the alphabet. And then we're going to start seeing something come out of that. That's even more incredible. Like people being able to communicate and organize in ways that would probably just break our brains to think about. Mm. Um. <sighs> yeah. yeah. There you go. That's my spiel. <laughs> um, which one do you think is going to have a greater impact, or it doesn't matter? The MRA movement or MGTOW, or you're not sure? Um, I think, um, and I know what I say may, may anger people, but I think that ultimately the only way that men are going to have a space to be vulnerable is if women make that space for them. Ooh. <laughs> that, so, yeah, some people are not going to like that, but eh, it's only your opinion, so... Yeah, it's well, my it's my opinion, and I would also say that a lot of MGTOW, um, when I ask them, you know, do you want a situation where women come back to you because they have to, like because they they, they that's their best option. Um, is that is that like is like if if society crashes and women come back to men and say and and you know smile and bat their eyes and say, you know, I I, I love you but it's really because I need to continue to survive. Is that what you really want? Hmm. Oh, have you asked any? Or you, you're, or... Yeah, I have asked them, and, and I, I usually don't get a response to that. Uh, oh, I, yeah, I, 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 I was I, curious. I, oh, okay. Hmm. Because I, I don't know if they would, you know, 
uh, if they'll give you a response when you put this out. But uh, okay. this is this is this is this is my question. Would you, is this what you want? Do you want women to come back because they because they haven't learned anything morally? They haven't learned that they value you for you, but simply because they still value you as an oxen, essentially. As a machine. As a machine. Mm. And I don't think that will solve anything. It'll mm. just mean that we delay the, the ultimate problem. So I don't think that's a... That, first of all, I don't think that'll solve anything. Um, I, I totally understand why some a man would go his own way. And mm. I would never stop or want to prevent that or judge him for doing that. I just don't think that a collapse of society is going to solve the problem um, that that mm. women don't value men for just being human beings. Um, mm. And I don't think that women coming back to men because they realize that they need them, need their service is going to solve that problem. Now, if you, if you don't think that that's a problem that can be solved, then I mean, it's just, it's like, it's different, 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 uh, 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 different ideas of, of what's going to happen or what society needs or whatever. But to me, in my mind, I, I, is, I, well, that's all. That would, do you want that? Do you want women to come back because they simply have to recognize your value as a machine and start being nicer to you to get that value? Oh, oh wow. That's, I had to get, I, I'm going to try to get the answer to that from somebody. <laughs> um, because... It, it you know like it doesn't seem like that would be going forward, right. just delaying the inevitable. And personally, I wouldn't want that. But uh, yes, yeah, that's 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 a tough one. Um, and uh, like I said, I I think that the only true solution, if 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 people if 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 that isn't an acceptable solution, the idea that women simply learn or just simply come back because they need to get your service again, so they need to be slightly nicer about it. If that isn't an acceptable solution, then the only place that a real acceptable solution is going to come to you is when women grow the fuck up and start to realize that when someone's vulnerable, that means you, 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 you help them and you care for them. And it's an invitation to love them even more. Mm. So that, that's my opinion. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I sit for it, but <sighs> well, that's what I—that's what I would ask. I mean, is that what you want? Have you? And ultimately, it doesn't matter because if society crashes, we can't really do anything about it. That's but, that's true. That's very true. Um, all this armchair uh, theorizing doesn't mean a hill of beans. Mm. Have you ever heard of um, Esther Vr and her book? Esther Vilmer? Yep. The Manipulated Man. Have you read it? Because I, yep. I, I keep hearing a lot of good reviews about it. I've never read it. I'm not sure what to think about it. Um, it's it's a good book. Um, I think she influenced my views a lot. Uh, wow. I think, um, I'm a lot less, uh, maybe a lot less pessimistic about women. Okay. Um, although I have been more pessimistic about women in the past. Hmm. Um, I think that in many cases, a lot of this, the changes in women may be driven by vanity because when you have a new medium, you generally have a new beauty ideal. And, uh, we, 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 I mean, cause if you think about it, um, in, in a verbal, an oral tradition, it was more about the sirens were the most beautiful women cause they could create the most beautiful sound. In visual tradition, of course, you have the emphasis on visual beauty. And in another tradition, it's going to be something completely different. So will modern women measure up in that tradition? Uh, and it might just be vanity that makes them uh, re reassess their priorities. But I don't know. I mean, this is a lot of stuff to think about. Okay, I'm going to try to wrap it up. Sorry if you're a little bit tired, but uh, let me see. Do you know if Karen still does interviews? I've, I've contacted her, but I didn't get a response. Are you not sure? Yeah, she's notoriously hard to get a response. To. Ah, so, so so it's just a normal thing. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a normal thing. Okay, uh, so I can just... ask on her your behalf, though. Say what? I can ask her if she'll do an interview on your behalf. 
Uh, that that'd be helpful, yeah. Um, so, uh, just uh, are you Obsidian from? Uh, YouTube Obsidian Dash Radio. That's me. Okay, um, nah, so there was actually name. an Obsidian before that I interacted with a long time ago. Um, no, that's not uh, the one that uh, emailed you. That that's me. Okay, so it's probably completely different Obsidian. So you, you are a MGTOW channel. Uh, I want to say I. It's like I, I said this before in a comment. I wouldn't call myself that, but I agree with the a lot of the philosophy. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, go ahead. Are we, are we gonna say something? Well, I wasn't gonna say anything. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of fading here, so I'm gonna have to get going soon. So. Oh, uh, there was that one comment you made on that one Honey Badger Radio that you did about a week ago, where you talked about um. How the opposition makes someone stronger, or something like that. Yeah. You want to expand on that, or is that too much right now? Well, when you're opposed, you really have to bring out the best of yourself. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, um, I'm not sure. Like it's it, it enables you to actually dig deep and find those parts of yourself to to meet the opposition that you might never have have seen otherwise. Mm. And it's uh you know you, it, without. Without uh, a trial, I mean, without something to struggle against, then you never really create anything, you know? And right now, you would say that a lot of women, they don't really have a really strong thing to actually struggle against right now because they're having their agency removed by this system. The thing is that everything that, every struggle that they could have is delegitimized by saying, well, it's something, a struggle that she shouldn't have. Right. That, 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 you know, if a man gives you a problem, then he should stop doing that. If he gives you a problem, he should stop doing that. If you're having a problem, you, should, you know, that's because society is against you. They delegitimize all struggles. So instead of saying, you know, deep, look deep in yourself, you've, you've bitten off a hard thing to chew, but it's up to you to chew it. Um, they say, no, nah, well, any struggle is blah, blah, blah. It's not, it's not a legitimate struggle. So mm. it gives them an out, I think, mentally, which ultimately weakens them. Okay. So yeah, it's when you struggle, when you when you have to draw on reserves of strength that you would never have otherwise known you had. Because mm. um, I mean, without the struggle, you would never have had to tap them. It, is it right? Mm. Um, why is it called Honey Badger Radio? I was very uh, curious about that. A long time ago, or not a long time ago, like in two thousand. 13 early 2013 maybe 2012 um factory who's somebody i knew since about 2003 said that we noticed that um female men's rights activists were starting to uh they were starting to become more of them and he said that you know we were challenging things um doing something interesting he said well you should get a better name or because we didn't he's saying that men's rights activism sort of sucks as a name <laughs> so why don't you name yourself something better and then tar uh shrink for men tara pomier suggested i'm probably saying that wrong pomier suggested uh honey badger from you know the randall honey badger don't give a fuck thing and then I was like, I actually argued against a separate name. I was like, we don't need a special name. Um, and uh, but later on, when I decided that we should, there should be three, um, three voices, three female voices from the men's rights movement, who uh, spoke up um, for men's issues. I suggested Honey Badger Radio, oh. and uh, just just because I didn't know what else to call it, oh. really. Oh, okay. It wasn't, it wasn't, and then I sort of got, I got more okay with the name because now it's more like than instead of being a special name for female men's rights activists, it's more like a team name. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's, it's like, I, I can sort of be okay with it because it's, it's like I'm part of the team as a badger. So that's okay. But having a special name for me as a men's rights activist, a female men's rights activist, I'm not okay with that. So in that context, I would not want to apply it to myself. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. Um, so do you have all the links, all the sites that you have, the Honey and Badger? Is there a website for Honey and Badger Radio? Or? 
Honey, oh, honeybadgerbrigade.com. And your YouTube sites were what again? Um, it's a, uh, you can do it just a, a, a search on YouTube um, for Honey Badger Radio. Right. That's our, our name, basically. But oh, okay. Yeah. And, um, and also Twitter, Honey Badger Bite. And I also have a Tumblr, Honey Badger Radio, but uh, it's mostly my crazy ideas about certain shows, so it might not interest people. And we just type in your name, Allison Tiemann, on YouTube and find that too, right? For your... Well, actually, it's Gender Attic. Oh, Gender Attic. Okay, Gender Attic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think that's it. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks for, for the interest. Uh, really like the interview. Appreciate you coming on. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me. No problem. You have a good night. Yeah, you too. And I'll message you a little bit after this, too. Okay. No problem. Thanks. And that is it for this episode of Obsidian Radio. Thanks for listening. Peace. That's the end of this episode of Obsidian Radio with your host, Najee. Thank you all for listening. I hope you learned from it and enjoyed. Please check out the Obsidian Radio YouTube channel and Google Plus page for episodes of the show. Also, check out the RoboMan5 YouTube channel and Google Plus page for my rants, blogs, show episodes, and my original music. And finally, check out the Obsidian Radio website for episodes of the show and episode archives. Please like, share, subscribe, and or donate to be a part of this radio show. There will be more enlightening and entertaining episodes posted soon. Peace.